we have, last week we had, how many of you saw the, with the band from the UK coming here? Wasn't that fantastic? <laughs> That was the first time I'd seen something like that in church, and I loved it. And it was a great message, also. Um, but, the, but the musicians were fabulous. And I, I got a hold of one of the CDs, and the music, is, now I can listen to it all the time. So I'm very thankful for that. Are those CDs available? Yeah, so if you're interested in CDs, I mean, not, I mean I'm not, but you know, we want to make those available. So uh, Hillary is connected to the group, and uh, Jim, so if you actually would like to have a way to connect with their music, it is available, and it's, it's good. So anyway, um, what I'd like to, we have been working on a series when we have had opportunity, uh, and the series has been called, uh, What is God Doing? What is God Doing? And, and this is a question that most of us ask when we are in difficult circumstances or we're in a difficult relationship. We've been praying to God, asking for Him and His answers to prayer, and things are just not working out the way that we thought they should. And, um, and so we're asked the question, what is God doing? And this is a very serious question for us. I know it was... Uh, a serious question for me and earlier, uh, especially one particular point in my life when I, I, I made a very bad judgment about what God was doing and I turned my back on God and walked away. So it's a, it, it, if, if we do not have a good answer, a good understanding of what God is doing um, when we are going through uh, difficulty, it can lead us to disappointment, to despair, and even the temptation to walk away from God. So we've been looking at ways to answer this question from different perspectives by looking at the life of two brothers, Joseph and Judah. And when we're looking at the lives of these two brothers, we're asked the question, what is God doing? And especially when others are committing evil against me or against an innocent person. This was the life experience of Joseph. He had evil committed against him, very serious evil. And what was God doing in that? Then there's the, uh, asking the question, what is God doing, doing when a person is committing evil against other people? Knowingly and willfully, what is God doing then? This is the story of Judah, at least at the beginning. Both of these, uh, the same question asked in two different situations, or at least um, two sides of the situation. Now let me make this personal. As we can say, well, okay, evil, yeah, something out there. No, it's actually real close to home, I want to ask you a question. How many of you find it difficult to admit when you are wrong? <laughs> I mean, this has to be one of the most difficult things for human beings to do. And you know what, I, I want to show, can we do that? I want to show a short video clip of someone who's having a very difficult time admitting that he is wrong. He has given his friend bad advice. Then he realizes, I've given him bad advice. Now he's coming to him to admit that he is wrong. because you're not going to join him again. Just take all this stuff home, okay? But Fonzie, not join? I'm all packed. You told me it was the right thing to do. Look, I know what I told you to do, but when I told you to do that, I was rehearsing. <laughs> Ralph, I was rehearsing. 
I was not exactly right. What do you mean not right? I mean not right. I don't get you. You mean you were wrong? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Malfa. I was what you just said I was just then, yeah. Wrong? The farm's wrong? Malf, look. <laughs> there is a first time for everything, huh? I don't understand, Fonz. How could you be wrong about a thing like that? I don't understand it myself. <laughs> I don't understand myself. <coughs> he could not even say the words. I was. Did you have those moments? Ah, oh, it's so hard. It's so hard to admit. And and so, uh, but that is a crucial step for all of us to be able to make that step to admit when we are wrong. And I want to, uh, I want us to meet someone today, it's Judah, who has to go through unbelievable amount of pressure on his life before he will admit, I am wrong. And it's, it's through, and what my hope is for today is that through Judah, we will understand how important it is that we learn how to admit it when we are wrong. That we, if we want to grow as Christians, that we have to get comfortable with the reality that we make mistakes, that we sin, that we even commit evil from time to time. And maybe you're even in a place where you're in a sin in your life and God is trying to put pressure on you in order to bring you to the place of admitting that you're wrong. So we'll look at the life of Judah. By way of, of review, we remember that Judah was one of 12 brothers, of one father who had these 12 brothers by four different wives. The father loved one son more than any of the other sons. And he let everybody know that. He treated him with special status. So much so that the other brothers hated this one brother. That brother was Joseph. And the hatred grew so strong that they were moving and plotting to murder him. But one day when that plan was coming together, it is Judah that rises to the occasion and begins to exert leadership in his family. I want to read the first couple of, a couple of verses from chapter 37, verse 26 and 27. Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers Listen to him. Judah had leadership skills. He was able to formulate a plan in a crisis and get others to follow him. That's a good quality. Problem was that Judah was using it in the wrong way. Right? Full of hatred. Um, he, his, his motivation for his leadership was not correct. He uh, convinced his brothers to sell Joseph into, into slavery. So the first thing we can say about Judah, if we were to develop a resume for him, a CV, I guess you call it here in Moldova, the first thing you would put on his resume is say, he's a slave trader, okay? He, he, uh, he, had, he was so corrupt morally that he thought he was doing his brother a favor by not killing him, just, just selling him. Thought that was a better option. Um, but the problem with Judah and the story of Judah is that it goes downhill from there, starting in chapter 38. Let's read the first five verses and see where Judah goes. It came about at that time that Judah departed, or went down, from his brothers and visited, or turned aside, to a certain Adulamite, Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son and named him Ur. Then she conceived again and bore a son and named him Anna. She bore
bore still another son and named him Shelah, and it was at Chizib that she bore him. So in just five short verses, we discover that Judah has left his family. He's left them behind, his brothers in particular. He, it literally means he went down and away. For we cricket fans and baseball fans, when you pitch the ball and it breaks down and away. It's unhittable, right? He was unhittable at this moment, okay? Then he sees and takes um, a Canaanite woman, and in rapid succession, boom, 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 they have three sons, and he names those three sons, okay? So, Canaanite uh, culture is a bad culture. His great-grandfather, Abraham, was so concerned about their, their corruption that he forbid that his son would marry anybody in the Canaanite culture. Uh, um, Judah's grandfather also forbid his son to marry the Canaanite. But here he just jumps in with all four into the middle of Canaanite culture and uh, marries and has three sons. All right, so now let's continue and see where this goes, starting in verse 6. Now Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Hanan, Go into your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her, and raise up offspring for your brother. Hanan knew that the offspring would not be his, so when he went into his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground, in order not to give offspring to his brother. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, so he took his life also. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, I'm afraid that he too might die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. So what we have here is a jump forward in time, about 20 years. Um, and when his oldest son reaches the age to marry, the father went out and found him a wife. Her name is Tamar. Um, but this, this son is so evil, the Lord himself took his life. This is the first time in the Bible where the Lord takes out an individual because of their evil. It's so great. So he dies. The father turns to the second son, says, okay, you know the rules in the ancient Near East. You come in and you fulfill the duty of providing a child for your son, so his name will endure. He doesn't want to do that. He is so evil, God looks on his heart and he takes him out. Two sons, uh, you know, are dead. Interesting thing about this is that Judah himself shows absolutely no emotion about the death of his two sons. And he also refuses to accept the reality that it is the evil of his sons that caused their deaths. What did he decide was the problem? Hey, Mark. He married my first wife, he died. You marry my second son, and he died. So here's the problem. Not their sin. And so he shifts the blame off of his sons and puts it on to Tamar. She's the problem. I've got to get rid of this woman. I'm going to send you back home and let you live in your father's house. But don't worry. I will give you to my third son when he's old enough. I'll give you a call. You just go down there and you just wait, okay? Now, Tamar is a defenseless widow at this point, and Judah has the legal and moral obligation to take care of her, but he does not. He ships her off. To Tamar's credit, she obeys Judah. She returns to her father's house, she puts on a widow's clothing. She honors the death of her, her husband. And she waits. 
sitting by the phone, waiting for the call. That was never going to come. Okay, now there is the first time in the text where Judah shows an emotion. What is that emotion? Fear. What is his fear? Wow, if this woman hooks up with my third son, he might die too. He fears for the life of his youngest son. This is going to be a crucial emotion, crucial moment for Judah later in the story when he goes back and his father shows fear for his youngest son, Benjamin. He's going to be able to identify with his father and his fear because he has had this experience. So, that's something we'll come back to later, okay? So, is, is this thing going to turn around? Let's see. Let's read 12 through 19. Okay, after a considerable time, she was daughter, the wife of Judah Dad. That's his wife. And when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to his sheep shears, at Timnah, and he left, he and his friend Harah, the Adulamite. It was told to Tamar, Behold, your father in law is going up to Timnah to shoot sheep. So she removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and <coughs> sat in the gateway of a name which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah had grown up and she had not been given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, for she had covered her face. So he turned aside to her by the road and said, Come now, let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What will you give me, that you may come into me? He said, Therefore, I will send you a young goat from the flock. She said, moreover, will you give a pledge until you send it? He said, what pledge shall I give you? She said, your seal and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave it to her and went into her and she conceived by him. Then she arose and departed and removed her veil and put on her widow's garments. Do you ever remember hearing this? Story in Sunday school? <laughs> Is there a figurine of, uh, of Judah in the flannel graph box? No. You're not going to find it. And if this is a story that tends to get jumped over <laughs> in Sunday school for good reason. But uh, so anyway, um, he, much time has passed, and it should have been the time for Judah to deliver on his promise to Tamar. But instead, after fulfilling the, the, the duty to grieve his wife, he puts on his party clothes to head for a party. Because sheep shearing is a very festive celebration. The drinks are flowing, the food is piled on the tables, and everybody's having a good time. And that's exactly what he's planning on doing. So the problem is that Judah, there's nothing wrong with going to the party, it's just he's going to the wrong party. He should be throwing a wedding party for Tamar and his third son, but he's not. So at this point, Tamar understands that Judah is not going to keep his promise. She, in the meantime, has been faithful, and she has kept her promise. She's been wearing the widow's clothing all that season that of waiting. And now she does what she feels she needs to do to protect herself. So she dresses up like a prostitute, hides her face, and goes out and stands by the road. Judah is anticipating a good time in the party. He looks, he turns aside. And this is the same language of before, when he turned aside from his family and went away. <laughs> and because Judah is acting on a lustful impulse, he's not ready to pay for this encounter. He's not prepared for this. He's just acting on an impulse. 
So he has to bargain with the woman. It turns out that Judah is not a very good negotiator. He enters into this negotiation, he keeps giving up everything. For this brief sexual encounter, Judah gives up his seal, his cord, and his staff. This is the modern equivalent of giving somebody a passport, your credit cards, and your wallet. You can imagine doing that and you this with somebody and saying, hold on to that, and I'll come back. And that's exactly what he does. So Tamar gets what she, what she came for. All of his personal identification. All of it. And she gets pregnant. So we can add to Judah's growing re uh, reputation and resume as a impulsive person totally lacking in self-control. Now let's, let's read the last section here to see what happens. Three months later, Judah was informed, your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the harlot, and behold, she's also with child by harlotry. Then Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. It was while she was being brought out that she sent to her father-in-law, saying, I am with child by the man to whom these things belong. And she said, please examine and see whose signet ring and cords and staff are these. You to recognize them and said, she is righteous, not I, inasmuch as I did not give her to my son Sheba, and he did not go have relations with her again. Wow. This is where it gets pretty intense. Judah hears that Tamar is pregnant by harlotry, and she plays a prostitute. What's his response? Oh, you know, I just did that myself. I think I'll show some grace. No, he is raging against her, wanting to kill her as a raging response. And uh, it's just so interesting that he's so quick to condemn Tamar for the very same crime that he himself has committed. It's so easy to point out the sins of others, isn't it? And ignore our own sin. I don't know if any of you struggle with that. But uh, I know I do. Very easy for me to, to see what other people are doing. Very difficult for me blind to my own sin. But as we can see, Tamar is no dummy. She is ready uh, for this moment. She's a survivor. She has had an injustice done against her, and she's going to try to make it right. So as she's being dragged unceremoniously, we've seen this in the New Testament, remember? When they brought the woman caught in adultery, to Jesus. The question is, where was the man? It takes two to tango, right? They were both there, but they only brought the woman. They don't ask her, you know, about the man. It's just the woman getting dragged across the city square. She's going to the city gate. They'll judge her, and then they will burn her to death. But in the cool moment, she says, oh, excuse me. Um, I, I, I've got some, some things here. The person that I got pregnant by, this is this information. Could you, could you see, uh, well, Judah, you yourself, could you take a look at this? But you just can imagine that moment, you know, opening up the passport, and he's looking at his own picture. There it is. Wow. And it is in that moment that Judah says, I am wrong. He does not say, I am <laughs> He says, I am wrong. She is righteous, not I. And he 
does not keep the commandments. Keeps her pure because that would be incest. He says, I'm not going there. Something changes in Judah's life. This, it turns out, is the turning point in Judah's life. Because we know that Judah is the one from whom the kings of Israel would come. We know that Judah is the one who is the, the father of David, ultimately, and would become the one from whom Jesus is born. That's an incredible legacy. That's a, 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 an incredible destiny to have on his life. How did he get there from here? It started right here when he said, I am wrong. I'm guilty. I'm sin. I have fallen short. I am not shifting blame off to anybody else. I am not living in denial. I am not uh, blowing up every time someone points something out in my life. I am coming face to face with myself. I see myself for who I really am. And I am wrong. And he names his sin. I did not give Kamar to my son. That's, he names the sin. That's so important. We don't just say, ah, yeah, yeah, I'm wrong. No, no, no. In what way? Specifically, name the sin. That's what he does. That is so vital for us then to confess it and have it forgiven and removed from our life. But Judah is confronted with himself. He is confronted with his failure, his deception, and he confesses it. And it's at that point that his life turns around. And there is a remarkable transformation that takes place in Jesus' life. Remarkable in, in the chapters to come. This was the turning point for Judah, and friends, this is the turning point for us. If we want to see something happen in our lives, we want to see God really, truly work in us, we are going to have to come to this point at some point. Now, in, in my case, um, I was a believer, but then I uh, got angry with God, and I turned my back on God. I walked away from God. So I was in a posture of rebellion and anger, for a period of years. And during that time, I had just so much brokenness in terms of relationships and, uh, and, and, and stuff that was happening in my heart. And it was just incredibly painful. And I had uh, a pastor sitting at a dinner table who just put down his fork. And he looked over at me and said, Paul, oh, you know what you need to do? I've not shared this before, but you need to draw a line in the sand, bro. You need to step over that line and never look back. He could see the divided heart. He could see that I was not walking with God in a, in a righteous way. That word just was like a bow and arrow just shot right through my heart. Did I confess? No. I just got more determined to not walk with God, more angry at everything around me, and I just kept going on the path that I had already been on. It was some time later that I had a flashback of that particular, that moment with that pastor, and those words came back to me again. And when I sat there and I counted off the time that had passed from that um, experience to where I was, Another five years had passed. And it was in that moment when I realized I had wasted five more years of my life. That was when I was broken. That was when I said, I am wrong. I am guilty. I have sinned against God. 
And, and it, was, it was then that God was able to come in and bring forgiveness and healing and began an incredible, it has been an absolutely incredible journey of transformation that I'm still on. And I pray I don't ever do that again, come off of it. 